want to um, talk today to you about um, a little bit more about space syntax and about the perspective of someone who lives and researches in this building. So this is home game, home territory for me. My office is um, three floors up here. Um, and in my research, and that's what I want to show today, um, I'm looking at buildings and building layouts and the decisions that architects take and what kind of um, responses we get from human users and how people use um, different kinds of spaces. Um, so I'm Kirsten Saylor, I'm a reader here in the Bartlett School of Architecture. My, my research interest is in spatial layouts and human behavior. And this is a quote from um, Robin Evans where he argues, if anything is described by an architectural plan, it is the nature of human relationships. And I think that's quite interesting because when you ask architects, normally what they would say a plan describes, they would say functions and walls and spaces and different areas and maybe places that they've designed. But they wouldn't certainly speak of this as it actually expresses human relationships. But that is exactly the, um, the interest that I'm pursuing in my research, to understand what architecture implies socially. So one of the research methods um, that I use in my research is space syntax. Um, Christoph has um, already talked a little bit about space syntax. And the idea of space syntax is to look at how can we explain certain collective patterns, mainly of human movement, that's the quite traditional space syntax research, and how can we explain that by the structure of buildings. So space syntax is a configurational theory and a method, so we look at different elements of space and how they are put together, and how, if we look at it as a network, we can explain um, how people feel about it, how people move about in buildings, and where and how people interact in space. Um, so what you see on the left-hand side here um, is a visibility graph, so it shows you the visibility relations, and that's a case study being done in the 1990s by Bill Hillier and colleagues, which shows the Tate Britain. And then you can see this movement um, flow picture, which is the first 10 minutes of 100 random people, how and where they walk through the Tate Britain. And you can see that they overlap. So the space syntax, the visibility notion, predicts to a great degree and where people go. So integrated spaces, those shown in warmer colors, will attract more people moving about, and the cooler colors um, are segregated spaces, and they will show lesser frequentation. Now, that's a quite, um, that was one of the starting points of space syntax, but space syntax is quite a diverse and vibrant research community. And we do all sorts of um, research that look quite detailed into the human condition, and we are not just interested in the collective patterns of movement. And I want to show some research examples um, from my work where we look at more detailed human behaviors, trying to find ways in which we can talk to those um, other behavioral sciences more and find ways in which, from an architectural point of view, we can contribute um, to that discussion. But before I show you some examples of my work, I would like to go back to two fundamental principles um, of space syntax research. The first fundamental principle is that space feels different from different vantage points. So what um, you can see here is a very simple um, building plan, and you can see that um, all of the different rooms, they are interconnected to one another. And if you are in the top image in that space marked with a zero, your perception of the space and how you would move about in the space is very different from the perception you have if you're in the bottom corner. One way to measure that is by aggregating the number of steps, which we call depth. How many steps of depth does it take me until I've reached everywhere else in the building? And because the top example, you're in one of the what we call integrated spaces, your distances are quite short. You can reach all the other areas um, immediately. What you can also see is that it results in quite a different graph theoretic representation. So those little dots. So if you start from that pink dot, the first step, you have choice. There's four different spaces that you can go to. That's very different from if you're in that bottom corner because there's only one room that you can go to and the space feels much more linear because you have to go from one space to another space. Now this is the same building. It's just perceived differently depending on where you are. And I think that's one of the very fundamental ideas of looking at space as a network is that it depends on where in the network you are 
of what perception you have of the building and how the building talks to you, how you feel about the building, and also your opportunities for engaging with others. So that's the first fundamental idea. The second fundamental idea is that space is not static. So our experience of space is quite dynamic. And this is a very early example um, from Bill Hillier in his um, first book and then later in Space is the Machine, where he gives a simple example of three rooms, A, B, and C. And you can see in the left-hand example, there's a symmetry in the relationship. So you can go from the outside world, C, you can go to A and to B. So both rooms are equal. You can move around freely between the rooms. Now, in the second example on the right-hand side, there's just one simple change. The door between B and C is closed off. That suddenly turns around the spatial dynamics because now you can't reach B unless you go via A. So you create asymmetry in the plan, but that also means you assign a role to A, which is about control, because now A controls the access to B. So A and B are no longer equal. They are unequal, there's asymmetry. And what's so stunning about this is that the relationship between A and B is always the same. It's two rooms, they're exactly identical, they always have one doorway. So the change is not because of the relationship between A and B, but because of the relationship of the outside world C. That changes the whole picture. And again, that's quite meaningful in the way that we can think about space, is that it's not necessarily just where I am, but it's also what else I can go to from where I am, and what levels of control I have over different kinds of spaces. So how can we use this? Um, and I've, I've labeled this as five ways of using space syntax differently to show ways in which space syntax doesn't just look at the collective patterns, but we're trying to delve into aspects of user experience and the diversity and dynamics of social spatial behaviors. So the first example um, I've brought today is to think about attractor-driven movement. So I've showed you the details of movement in the Tate Britain, where part of the initial idea is that movement flows according to the layout. Wherever rooms are more integrated, more people will be found moving. If you look at some types of buildings, that is certainly true. If you look at other types of buildings, you can see how the relationship breaks. A lot of my research I did in workplaces and office buildings, and certainly in office buildings, people don't move randomly, right? I have a desk somewhere, and I start my journey from that desk, and when I come in in the morning, all of my behaviors are quite routinized. I go to the kitchen and get myself a coffee, and then I go back to my desk. So I do things in a certain pattern. So one of the ways that we can describe this is to think of movement both driven by the layout, but then also by where we put things. So this is an example of um, one of my early pieces of work. Um, this is a research institute for theoretical physicists. And what I could see there, the blue lines are the movement traces and that were observed. And you can see how people do not just go through the layout according to the opportunities, but they seek out certain spaces. Um, you can see in the corner there, and they put up some quite fancy coffee machines, and there was a lot of movement attracted by those coffee machines. So one of the way to look at this um, was to think about not just the layout, but also the attractors. So what I did was to interview people about their choices of which attractors they would use and how often. Um, I did around 100 user interviews and then plotted those paths, the shortest paths from their offices to those attractors and built a model that puts that attractor-led movement on top of um, the syntactic prediction. And we could improve the prediction quite significantly by taking those attractors um, into account. And that's published in a paper in 2007. The second aspect is how can we explain how buildings work differently for different types of people at different times of the day. Because buildings certainly are not fixed instances. And um, this is the British Library. And um, this is by far, I confess, my favorite building. Um, just around the corner from here. And this is the space in front of the King's Library. And it's one of the spaces that is being used all throughout the day. People rush in at the morning at 9 o'clock to actually grab those very seats. So I went in there with a group of my students, and we looked at 
the diversity and dynamics of that space use. So this is the space syntax diagram of the first floor. You can see the visibility relationships. You can see in the four corners are the big reading rooms where you can only go if you have a reader's pass. But then you can also see the different areas. So you can see that very um, red main path in front of the King's Library, which is actually one of the integrate, most integrated paths through the building. And that's still where a lot of people prefer to be, right at the intersection and facing the busiest movement path to find solitude, which is quite fascinating. So we looked at um, where do people choose to go, mapping activities. Um, it builds on um, these um, two quotes um, that we found from architects um, appreciating the British Library and the architecture, um, one by McCormack, who argues that the British Library seeks relationships with the individuals who use it and visit it through a sense of invitation to be a participant, not merely a spectator. And the other one by Stonehouse, where they argue a this is a building that allows usage to be an individual intimate act. And that's really interesting because the British Library is a huge, it hosts around on an average day 5,000 people how can this building allow an intimate act of usage for all of those people in all of the different corners? So that was what we were interested in. And what we looked at here um, is the patterns of behavior. So what do people do on week days and weekends? And so those are the, the bars that you can see here. I don't know if you can read this, but we looked at all sorts of different behaviors. So people who were eating and drinking, or people who were eating and drinking with a laptop at the same time, or people who were eating and drinking and reading. So we did some quite detailed observations of what people were actually doing. And the one piece of information I wanted to show you today is how the location that people chose as their preferred place to be in depended on the weekday weekend. So during the week, um, most people, and those are the blue bars that you can see here, um, so the the blue bars is during the week. So people using their laptops during the week tuck themselves away in the building so they have a higher average mean depth. So they are in the areas that are bluer and greener, cooler colors. So people working on their laptops during the week tend to tuck themselves away. Those measures drop significantly at the weekend where people seek more integrated spaces. Which is really interesting because that's a pattern that certainly no one is instructed to follow, right? Everyone is taking their individual decisions. But it seems that on the weekend people seek a more buzzy atmosphere, even though they are working with their laptops. Because you know it's the weekend and they want to do things maybe a little bit differently. So that's an interesting finding and that was published in a paper in 2015. The third piece of research I did together with one of um, our UCL alumni, a graduate student, um, on preferences and seat choice. So what we brought in here is the psychological theory of prospect and refuge. So the idea that as human beings, we like to have both at the same time. We like to be in a position where our backs are protected, where we have refuge, where we can hide ourselves away. But we also, at the same time, like to have long lines of sight. We like to be able to see, but no one should see us like that cat. So the setting we looked at um, were customer lounges. Um, so this is like an airport lounge um, without the airport. Um, so these are dotted around the city, um, a customer lounge. And what we were asking is which seats are most popular in that lounge. We did that by observation, so checking um, in hourly intervals and um, throughout several days, which are the places where people sit, how long do they sit there, so which are the most preferred seats. We had two different measures that we took into account. One was the type of seat, because the loungers had nine different seating types, from sofas and different comfy armchairs to high stools to low stools. So we looked at those. And then we also looked at the visibility where people sit. And the way we did that was to come up with a measure of what we called control. And we mapped the area of the isovist. Um, Christoph alluded to the isovist already, so the visual field. And we divided the area of the 180 degree isovist, so what I can see from where I stand, what is the area that is visible to me, divided by the area of the 360 degree isovist if I would turn around. 
Now, from my position right now, those would almost be the same. I'm in a situation of high control. No one is in my back. I can see everything. So my value would be close to one. Paul Christoph's value would not be so good at the moment because his viewing field is to the front. So his 180 degree isovist will be relatively small and the 360 degree isovist will be relatively large. So he's not in control, in visual control of where he's sitting at the moment. And what we found was that with these two measures, this type of seat, and by the way, the most preferred and was type four, and this comfy individual armchair, and which I think is um, what this lady here um, is sitting in. And if we brought those two measures together, we could explain around 40% of the variance of people's seat preferences with both the visibility experience, their choice of where they want to sit and what they want to see, and, and the seat type. The fourth piece of work I want to share today, um, again, is done by um, one of my students, former students, and um, she graduated last year, um, Lorena ben -Cosme. And what she looked at was networks of interaction in co-working spaces. Um, so she looked at one example of a co-working space and again mapped the visual field 170 degrees this time, which is kind of the forward-facing vision. And she was looking at, um, on these right-hand side, those spiky isovists. She was looking at, from every kind of seat, which other people do I see from where I sit? She would then turn these into network representations, so because she constructed the social network of who can see whom. And she then compared, on the right-hand side here, this image where she was showing what is the potential. So if I can see someone and they can see me, we have a high potential to talk. And she mapped that against the actual realized conversations throughout the day. What was really interesting is that the potential and the realized conversations really didn't map at all. So in the open space, I don't know how well you can see um, these images, they're fairly light. Um, so you can see here, there's a big open space, open plan with hot desks, a lot of potential for interaction, but hardly any interaction realized. According to traditional space syntax analysis, that would be the most integrated space where we would predict to see the highest levels of interaction. That's where everyone passes through. What we saw instead was a lot of interaction happening in the more secluded spaces of people actually collaborating with one another. And that's quite an interesting way to challenge the, pro the proposition of many co-working spaces is that by the pure virtue of going into these co-working spaces, you will be part of all these networks and you'll be automatically be benefiting from the opportunity to talk to one another where we could show that that doesn't come automatically. And the last piece of um, research is an ongoing project I'm involved in and which is called Paths of Pathogens in Hospitals. And so that's a different environmental setting we're looking at. Um, it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and we're midway through the project. So this is set against the background of antimicrobial resistance, which is this scary world in which antibiotics might not work anymore. And we're looking at design-led interventions or ideas of how the spatial layout of a hospital works differently for different user groups and different kinds of people. So in a hospital environment, you're bringing together the most vulnerable people with the most infectious people, and you tie all of that together with a very busy routine of lots of caregivers, medical students, physiotherapists, cleaners, porters, visitors. They're all moving through the space. They're all touching surfaces. So we're interested in what is the potential for people to actually spread um, different kinds of um, different kinds of pathogens. So this is the um, space syntax view of the, of the space. You can see the main corridor. But what we were more interested in is then to see how do people use that space. So if I'm a cleaner or if I'm a porter or if I'm a nurse assistant, do I use that space differently? So we were following people for around 15 minutes of their, um, of their journey. Um, which was very interesting to get that through the ethical approval because we did covert observations. So we didn't tell people that we would observe them. Because once you tell them that you observe them and you're interested in infection control, guess what happens, you know? They all start cleaning their hands manically and, um, you know, start moving around differently. And um, so we weren't telling people. 
that we would observe um, hand hygiene events. And this is a first snippet, so this is very hot off the press. Um, I got that out last week, which is a first glimpse into different user paths and you can already see different kinds of patterns of behaviors that different user groups make. So in the top corner is nurses' behavior, and that's very localized, very high frequency going in and out. Even more spread are nursing assistants. Um, you can see in the, um, in the middle section is visitors. Then you have the doctors and the, and the cleaners and the porters. So they have quite distinct behavioral patterns and behavioral paths. So that's the first step of thinking of different user groups and how the very same spatial layout serves different purposes for different user groups at different times of the day. And just as an outlook, and um, what I've presented here is an understanding of space as a layered network, as one lens that can help us to understand how different kinds of users behave in buildings at different times of the day, different times of the week, and because they belong to different user groups and have different preferences. Thank you.